Hello, and welcome back to the Story Savant podcast. Today, we're going to talk about the theme for February. It's romance. I'm sure you're shocked. And about why it's so important to tell historical romance stories. So stick around. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to the Story Savant podcast, where we geek out about stories and pull insights from them that will make us better human beings, all while going about our day, raising the kids, paying the bills, and striving to be compassionate, empathetic players in our own lives. You feel me? Hi, I'm Liesl Hill, author, entrepreneur, and story lover. I believe consuming stories in any form encourages Christian values, increases spirituality, and helps us develop a more transcendent and godlike understanding of the world around us, the universe at large, and God's plan for us in it. Come join me. Let's talk stories. Hello there, story savants. Welcome to the podcast. I'm a little bit late in giving you the genre theme for this month. It is romance for February. Definitely an original choice on my part. When I introduce a genre theme for the month, what that means is that the stories I analyze and the things I talk about will all center around that genre just for this month, and then we'll switch to a new one next month. Now, the first thing that I will admit is that I don't actually write genre romance. I do write historical romance or stories that can be categorized as historical romance. And the reason I say it that way is the romances I have thus far, I do not have very many tropes in them. Now, if you don't know what tropes are, you probably know what they are without actually knowing what they're called. It just means a particular kind of romance story. So something like friends to lovers, or having a pregnancy involved, or enemies to lovers, things like that. Those are tropes in romance stories, just the type of romance story it is. The stories I've written thus far lean more toward historical fiction than historical romance, but because they center around a romance, they can be considered historical romance. So the ones I have out right now are the Kremlin's Trilogy, which is based in medieval Russia during the time of Ivan the Terrible. And then I also have the first book of of my Templar romance series out. I'm probably not going to be able to return to that series until next year because I'm working on Dragon Magic this year. So I do intend to write a whole bunch more books for that series, but it's kind of on the back burner right now. So let's talk about historical romance. I personally don't write contemporary romance. No judgment about that. I just, it's not my particular thing. But I've always been a history buff. So you'll remember back in my story, I talked about how I changed from a medical and science major to an English major. I decided when I changed that I was going to do history as a minor because I've always been a history buff and I've always been interested in historical fiction. I'll talk more about my journey into Russian history in the next episode when I focus on Kremlins. But for now, let's talk about the importance of romance in stories. Even if you don't write genre romance or read genre romance, the vast majority of stories has a love interest in it. Why is that? Well, it's pretty obvious. It's because we human beings are wired for romance. We're wired for companionship, and romantic love is a big part of our lives. So even if the story isn't 100% based around that romance, romance does find a place in most stories. Several years ago, I attended a writer's conference. (laughs) There's one of my writer's conference stories again. And I was on a panel about time travel. Now, I assumed when I signed up for this panel that it would be sort of a science fiction-y time travel. And part of it was. But what I didn't realize is that they would also include historical fiction in the time travel panel. Because when you read a historical fiction story, basically what you're doing is transporting yourself back to that time and putting yourself into the story behind the character's eyes, right? Even though it's not necessarily categorized as time travel fiction online, historical fiction is often associated with time travel simply because it takes place in a different time. So why is historical fiction such a big deal? It is a niche market to be sure, which means there are only a small number of people that read it, but it's actually quite a large niche market. There's definitely an audience for it. We also see this in movies and TV shows. We have things like Braveheart, war movies, Renaissance films, all kinds of things. Why are we drawn to that? Well, the reason I mentioned the panel I was on is that I met another author there that said something really interesting to me that really resonated. Unfortunately, this was years ago, and I have no idea what her name was. I wish that I did so I could credit her with this. But we talked about how often historical fiction tends to be very sad. It is probably not a bigger market because it is so sad. There's plenty of people out there that don't want to read sad fiction. And historical romance does tend to have a lot of tragedy in it. We talked about 
this on the panel, and this particular woman talked about how she believes that we as a culture, as human beings, harbor a communal sadness about things that have happened in our history, and that is why we so often retell the stories. That really resonated with me. I think that's true. Historical fiction stories tend to center around things like wars, battles, a particular ruler, and the stories tend to bring out the more difficult aspects of life during that historical era and in that place, the things that were difficult to deal with, the trials they had. Now, that's not so different from any other story. Of course, there's always going to be conflict and there's always going to be trials, but something about historical fiction always comes across as very sad. So I thought that was an interesting way to think about historical fiction. So based on this woman's theory, the reason we retell these stories all the time is because we have a communal sadness over what happened. And that is true about many things and on many levels. We're sad that we let a dictator like Hitler get into power as far as he did before putting a stop to it. We're also sad about the young men and in some cases women that we lost during that battle. We try to remember them as soldiers who honorably fought and often sacrificed for their country so that others didn't have to live under that dictator. But there's still a communal sadness about the fact that that happened at all. And again, that's true of any historical fiction, any time period, any culture in which we're talking about. So what can we do with this information as we go throughout our lives? Despite the fact that I think that there's some truth in this communal sadness theory, I also don't think it would be healthy for us to go around blaming ourselves for things that happened long before we were born. That wouldn't be a very healthy psychological way to live. But that's where stories come in. We can retell these stories, remember what happened, take lessons from them, and use them in our own lives, and even experience them vicariously, but without letting them impact us in a negative way. So you might say that we kind of have the best of both worlds. We can experience these things and take away the lessons from them, or at least some of the lessons from them, without actually having to live them, without actually having to go through the sadness of those eras and those trials, and thereby enrich our own lives without having to experience the full tragedy of those circumstances. This is why telling historical stories is so important, both historical stories and just history in general. The best way to make sure we never repeat history is to continue to tell stories about it, even the ugly stuff. In fact, I would suggest the uglier the history is, the more important it is for us to retell it. It's the only way to remember it, the only way to make sure it never happens again. And I have to mention this in this podcast because recently there's been a couple of films, World War II films, that have come out that have been really, really good. We live in a time where we have such great technology when it comes to filmmaking that we can really put the audience into the experience of the story, and it's amazing. Over the last few months, I saw the films both Midway and 1917. They were different experiences and actually about different wars. Midway is, of course, about World War II, and 1917 is World War I. But both of them, I just really felt like I was really there in the story. I went and saw it in the theater, so you get the effect of the huge screen and the surround sound, and they're just fantastically made movies. And of course, saying that I felt like I was there is a little bit ridiculous, because even if you feel like you're in the plane with the dive bomber, you're obviously not dealing with gravity and and the pressure of altitude and things like that. You don't get the smells. You're not actually out on the plane somewhere freezing or starving. But as far as it's possible, I still felt like the experience was really, really amazing, and it gave me a much deeper compassion and understanding for what those young men went through who were fighting in the war. But I want you to think of your favorite historical fiction story. It can be a book, it can be a movie, you know, Braveheart, The Last of the Mohicans, whatever whatever is your favorite historical fiction story. And stop to think about why it's so important. What value does it have? What sadness is it bringing out that whoever told the story is trying to get the audience to experience so that it doesn't happen again? Then go share that story with someone. One of the best ways to not only teach ourselves about stories, but to spread their value is to share it with someone and discuss it with someone afterward. I've said this before, but this is something my family always does. After we see a film, we all sit around talking about it for a long time. And we've had other people who are friends or who come into the family, you know, via marriage, comment on that, how we sit around talking about it and analyzing it forever. But honestly, that's the way we learn from stories. And historical fiction and romance are both very, very important in fiction. All right. So the other thing I wanted to do today really quickly was to deconstruct a story using the nine story points that we talked about back in episode three. Because our theme this month is romance, I want to do a romance, but I've also talked about historical fiction today. So it should be a historical romance that everyone is pretty familiar with. So we are going to do Pride and Prejudice. Most people are fairly familiar with this. If you're not, it's very easy to go watch a film version. There's a Colin Firth version from the 90s that's about, it was a miniseries, so it's four or five hours long. There's the Keira Knightley version, which is only about two and a half hours long. Both of them are really excellent. Let's go over the nine plot points. And the biggest thing about this is that you can take these nine plot points and obviously you're going to be creating the story using them, but make 
make sure because you're doing romance that you are specifically addressing the romance in these nine plot points. The same could be true of historical fiction. If you're writing historical fiction, make sure that with each of these nine plot points, something about the history of the place and time you're talking about is in each of these plot points. That is what should turn with each plot point. So let's go to Elizabeth Bennet and Pride and Prejudice. Remember that the nine plot points are the world before, the intro of conflict, the escalation or call to adventure, the turning point, escalation number two, the climax, uber despair, the aha moment, and the resolution. So let's go over what these are for Pride and Prejudice. The world before. Jane Austen famously starts out with talking about how Elizabeth and her sisters are unmarried and how any single man in that society must be in want of a wife, right? So the world before is her being single and she's actually pretty happy being single. She doesn't really believe in true love. She doesn't believe she is capable of falling in love. So she's perfectly happy to stay unmarried her entire life. The intro of the conflict would be when she actually meets Mr. Darcy and simultaneously her sister Jane meets Mr. Bingley. Now it might seem kind of strange to call her meeting her own love interest the intro of conflict, but it is for a couple of reasons. Anytime you're writing a romance, remember that I said the intro of conflict means that the character's world changes in some way. The world has changed because she knows Mr. Darcy where she didn't before. But it's also true that in any great romance, the two lovers tend not to like each other very much at first. So there's literally conflict when they meet meet. And it's definitely true of Elizabeth because she finds Mr. Darcy to be really snooty and she actually hears him insult her at the dance. So this is the intro of conflict and her world has changed, but she doesn't really like Mr. Darcy very much. All right, so then we get the escalation or call to adventure. I actually think this could be two different things in Pride and Prejudice. One of them is meeting Mr. Wickham. Again, this may not seem like much of a conflict, but her world changes again because she meets someone and she actually kind of likes him. Also, this is an obstacle to her and Darcy getting together because there's another man in the picture. But that could also be part of the first call to adventure. She meets Mr. Darcy, then she meets Mr. Wickham, and you know, there can be more than one call to adventure, more than one escalation. The true escalation, I think, that makes things considerably worse, especially where the possibility of romance between Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy are concerned, is when Wickham tells her the lie about Mr. Darcy wronging him. And again, make sure with when you're writing romance that the escalation specifically has to do with the romance. There can be other things going on in the story, of course, but the escalation has to concern whether these two people are going to end up together. So this puts a much worse spin on who Darcy is and makes her hate him a whole lot more. When does the turning point come? The turning point comes when Elizabeth actually learns the truth about Mr. Darcy. You might be wondering if Mr. Darcy proposing is an escalation. It is a little bit, but it doesn't really change anything in the story. He proposes, and all it does is give her the opportunity to tell him what she feels about him, but it doesn't really change anything for her. It's just a lot of drama. But after that, he writes her a letter in which he tells her the truth about what happened with Mr. Wickham. That's the turning point because that's when Elizabeth Elizabeth's feelings about him just start to change. She's not in love with him right away. She's still pretty mad at him, but she starts to realize that maybe he's not a bad, as bad a guy as she thought and that Wickham lied to her. All right, so the story's got to keep going, and then we get a second escalation. Now, for a while, everything seems okay. She feels bad that she misjudged Mr. Darcy and realizes now that Wickham is a bad guy and Darcy isn't as bad a guy as she thought, but she also doesn't think there's anything she can do about it. She's just going about her life and goes on a trip with her aunt and uncle. The second escalation comes when they find out what Lydia has done in running away with Wickham. Obviously, this makes things much worse, and Elizabeth is absolutely sure if there was any hope of Mr. Darcy renewing his affections for her, this has absolutely stopped it because of the shame that will be brought upon her family and the social stigma of Lydia's elopement. So again, the escalation has to make things much, much worse, and it has to make the main character believe they will fail. So in terms of a romance, they've got to feel like there is no chance of this romance happening. None at all. Jane Austen accomplishes that well through Lydia's elopement. Then comes the climax. So, of course, this is just a bare bones structure. There will be other things that lead up to the climax. But again, remember that if you're writing a romance, all of the nine points have to center around the romance. It has to affect the romance. So, of course, other things are happening in the story. But the climax for a romance has to be the moment that really decides whether they're going to get together or not. In Pride and Prejudice, I believe this moment is when Lady Catherine de Bourgh visits Elizabeth at her house. She demands to know whether Elizabeth is engaged to her nephew, Mr. Darcy, and Elizabeth truthfully tells her no she is not. This may not be the most obvious climax. I'm going to get into some of these concepts in more detail 
a little bit later. But what isn't completely obvious is that Catherine de Bourgh is sort of a mirror for Elizabeth. The climax has to be a confrontation between the main character and the main antagonist. The thing is, it's kind of hard in a romance and especially in Pride and Prejudice to nail down a major antagonist for Elizabeth. Mr. Darcy himself is an antagonist at times, and of course Mr. Wickham is. But by this part in the story, both those things have kind of been handled and have changed. As I said, Catherine de Bourgh is sort of a mirror for Elizabeth. She never got married. She's very wealthy and she's very unhappy. Elizabeth has said that she doesn't really want to get married unless she finds true love. And the idea is that she could very easily end up like Catherine de Bourgh, albeit probably with less money, if she doesn't soften her heart and, you know, allow herself to fall in love. So when Catherine de Bourgh comes to visit her, she's kind of looking at a mirror of herself who's really being nasty to her, who's insulting her on many levels, telling her she has low birth and she's not worthy of Mr. Darcy. And to add insult to injury, Elizabeth truly isn't even engaged to him. It's a moment of extremely high drama and a confrontation between Elizabeth and one of her antagonists. The other thing that's very telling at this part is that Elizabeth sort of leads Catherine de Bourgh on and won't admit right away that she's not engaged to Darcy. And that really shows how her feelings for Darcy have changed. If she truly still hated him the way she did at the beginning, she would have simply said, no, I'm not engaged to him. Why would I be engaged to him? But she doesn't. She drags it out and you can tell that she feels sorrow and kind of wishes that she was. So that's when we really get her confronting her own feelings and kind of the solidifying of her realizing that she does feel something for Mr. Darcy. So you could call this the climax of the romance because this is when she truly confronts her own feelings and realizes what they are. The moment of uber despair comes here as well because with Catherine de Bourgh coming to visit her, it kind of, in Elizabeth's mind, nails the coffin shut on her and Mr. Darcy's relationship. The aha moment doesn't come until the next morning when Mr. Darcy himself comes to see her and ask if her feelings have changed. And it's really interesting the way Jane Austen crafts this, because even though the aha moment didn't come directly after the uber despair moment, Elizabeth herself is the creator of the aha moment. Because of what she said to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, that is what made Darcy realize that her feelings might have changed and spurred him to come see her. So it was something she did that created the solution, which was, of course, that they were in love and should end up together. And of course, the resolution is they get married. Now, that's only one plot. We could also go through these nine plot points for Jane and Mr. Bingley. I won't, but you can go through and do them yourself and identify them. You could even apply these plot points to Lydia. Now, Lydia doesn't end up happily, but you could see her as an anti-hero, and you could still apply these nine plot points to her arc and see how she went from kind of a petulant child to a petulant adult that didn't end up with a deep, abiding relationship the way Jane and Elizabeth did. But the nine plot points are still there to cover her arc. They're just more subtle because she's a side character. Okay, so I hope that that helped you if you're somebody who's reading or writing romance. I would encourage you to go find your favorite story, whether it's in book or film or TV form. It can be a romance, it can be a historical fiction, it can be a contemporary romance if you prefer that. Apply the nine plot points to the romance and see how it all comes out. Next week I'm going to talk about my historical fiction trilogy, Kremlins, how I came up with it, and what my relationship is to the story and to the characters. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you found some value in this episode. If you would like to support the show as a patron, hop over to www.patreon.com forward slash story savant. If you're big on Facebook, join our Facebook community at bit.ly forward slash story savant Facebook. To get a free PDF of my nine essential plot points for a page turning story, sign up at bit.ly forward slash story savant courses. All these links are in the show notes. Thanks for joining me today. You can find all my fiction on my website at authorlkhill.com forward slash books. If you found value in anything you've heard today, do me a favor and go leave me a review on iTunes. It's the best and easiest way that you can thank me and help others to find and be inspired by the same concepts. Together, we can lift each other through our stories to new heights of understanding and compassion for our fellow man and gain an eternal godlike perspective on our own spirituality. So go consume some stories today. I give you permission.